Hola, hola, hello, hola, amigos, amigas. Welcome to today's event from home. Another controversial topic, another chapter of the history of this wonderful country called Peru. Uh, and also land of the Incas, of the ancient pre-Inca societies that even date back to 5,000 years ago with one of the newest cultures discovered and studied properly in the 1990s, Caral. So today we are going to open that book of the history of Peru and we're going to focus in one of the chapters of this book. Indeed, a controversial chapter because talking about sexuality uh, is, is not something that is so easy to handle. Uh, it's not something you're going to see usually referred in, in books, in traditional books uh, that talk about uh, the history of this land. So today we're going to talk about the sexuality in pre-Hispanic Peru, in ancient Peru. How was sexuality? how people perceive themselves, uh, men, women. Was there any homosexuality in the pre-Hispanic times? All these questions are going to be addressed today in this event that I have all, also, uh, you know, I'm very open about uh, this theme. Uh, so I, of course, prefer that the audience will be entirely of adults. Also, first I will say hi to the people joining, to my friends joining. I see uh, some uh, familiar names to me. Hola, Adrian. Hello. Hola, Cari. Hello. Thanks for coming again. Hola, hola, amigos. Hola, Janine. Hello. Thanks for joining. Hola, Patrick. Hola, Trisha. Hello. Hola, Susan. I started a little bit earlier also because, um, well, today, uh, as you know, probably you've seen in, in, the, in the chart of the activities of Hago uh, today, there are, as always, wonderful, wonderful tours. But I would like to join also a tour that is happening right after this one, which is uh, a tour with our friend Sayuri. And she's going to be doing a special tribute to one of our Hago guides that now, you know, is in heaven, uh, Francis. I had the pleasure of meeting Francis uh, almost at the beginning of my virtual, you know, experience as a tour guide. And he was a very nice colleague and person. So um, we are all shocked by, by his loss. And I would like also to join the event to, to that one. So I try to uh, uh, join this one a little bit earlier to say hi properly to the people joining. Uh, and if possible, to, to visit Sayuri also with this tribute to uh, our friend Francis Vieira. So uh, before we begin, and now I see people joining. Hola, hola, amigos. Hola, Terry. Hola, Terry. Thanks for coming. Hola, hola. Hola, Jan. Hola, Anita. Hola, Neil. So uh, as you know, we have here a chat zone where we, we can talk, we can um, exchange ideas, we can uh, exchange opinions about, um, well, the things we're going to be talking about uh, today. Um, so uh, I am not a historian or an archaeologist. I would love to. I am an official tour guide here in Peru. Guiding in Peru is a profession that is, uh, is, is controlled by the government. It's not just a hobby. It's not that something that if you want to do, you do, you know, like uh, with no preparation. In Peru, we study to become tour guides. And when we study the career, we learn about different topics, about different things. In particular, we focus in archaeology and history. Uh, so today's event is inspired in this book, which is one of my favorite books, one of my books of consultation. Uh, every time 
I, I know they have a group that is interested in particular in uh, erotism and sexuality in the pre-Hispanic times. And it's a book that is in two languages, Spanish and English, uh, Sexuality in Pre-Hispanic Peru. This is a book that also you can find online uh, that is going to give you a good introduction into uh, this theme. Uh, um, but we're going to be using also different tools today to understand uh, this topic. Uh, well, now we're going to go to our event. Thanks for joining once again. Thank you, thank you for coming. Hola, John. Hola, Anita, Virginia. Breathe. Hola, hola. Thanks for joining, Robert. Hola, hola. Uh, so, as you know, our tours here on Hago are all free and uh, they are just tip supported. If you would like to support this uh, event or any other I do or any other my colleagues on Hago do uh, with, with a tip, maybe uh, you can do it even until the end of this event. You don't need to do it right away because we're going to focus in this event 100%. Uh, I will just activate a tip button that is over there. Hola Virginia, hola Robert, uh, so that you can you can also use if you wish to donate and contribute also for, uh, in my case, for me to create more events like this one and also Hago uh, to still to keep a free platform uh, that uh, will can be joined um, by anyone around the world with no uh, previous payments. No? So that's something I really love about Hago. Uh, so, well, now we're going to begin with our event and thanks for joining once again. So I will turn off the light. Uh, uh, so in that way, we will have a better, a better view of our um, screen. Uh, and of course, all your questions are welcome. I am so happy to have you and that we can learn together about sexuality in pre-Hispanic times. Oh, La Virginia, uh, is it okay to ask if you will do your synchronization? Yes, Virginia, I think I can do it again soon, of course. If there's any any event you would like me to do again, just, you know, comment what, what would you would like me to, to do again. Also, I recorded that event. It is in my YouTube channel, if you wish to give it a look also there. Uh, but any theme, any any topic you would like me to cover, uh, I am always happy to, to address those uh, topics in particular. You are helping me always to create new things. See? Gracias, Virginia. So, and today, of course, the, the, the theme of today is, is really interesting. Sexuality in pre-Hispanic Peru. Uh, it is also a theme that is not very well um, investigated still nowadays, although um, archaeologists have also dive in like different topics, like for example, how was the life of the of the children in pre-Hispanic times and, and women in the pre-Hispanic times and men in the pre-Hispanic times. Um, sexuality um, is, is a little bit complicated uh, for them to understand because first of all, um, we have the chronicles of the Spanish, we have the, the chronicles of the conquistadors, the documents they, they made from their experiences in this territory. We have also potteries that help us. Oh, the potteries actually will be of, of consult uh, today that will help us to understand also a little bit of how they perceive sex, uh, their sexuality, how they live their sexuality. So we're going to be using both tools today. Um, so here you have a chart of the history of Peru before the coming of the conquistadors. So before I go to explain a little bit about the chart, you can start reading a little bit of the names there and the cultures. Uh, so as you know, in this event, we're going to talk about um, like documents from the Spanish called Chronicles, and we're going to talk about and explain pre-Hispanic vessels, pottery, which is called erotic pottery, okay? And the culture that made most of this erotic vessels or potteries is known nowadays as the moche culture uh, moche or mochica culture let me just check with you the name over there mochica so referring to the period between beginnings of christian era until more or less the year 700 of our era 
right? So in the erotic pottery, because the documents, you know, can be very diverse and they can take us to, you know, and, and different interpretations of sexuality in the pre-Hispanic times. But the potteries, the erotic potteries are much more, you know, like explicit, right? Uh, and in them, we can see content like, for example, erotic scenes, acts of intercourse, anthropomorphic representations or with large genitalia. No? We can see also exaggerated genitals, male and female, in those pieces of, of potteries. We can see sexual relations between humans, also animals, no? uh, like basically trying to explain the, uh, the sexual behavior of the animals, probably. Uh, also, we have, in a lesser extent, homosexual representations, or uh, uh, let's say homosexual, lesbian representations, which we're going to be talking about later. So the chronology we see here, oh, hola, Tish, hello, hello, Kari. <laughs> so the uh, chronology you see here oh, uh, give us a couple of clues about how was uh, or how complex and how many societies we had in pre-Hispanic Peru. Uh, so when we talk about Peru, most of the times we think in the Incas. So look where the name Inca is. Inca is here above, right? Is the end, is the end of this uh, sort of like a pyramid of development, of cultural development in Peru. But, oh, sorry, it's activating my, <laughs> my voice. Sorry, just give me a second. We're going to go out of this. I don't know what's happening with this computer. Okay, so we're going back. Well, um, we know that the erotic representations in potteries, uh, which are the only document we have nowadays in Peru made by our ancestors that we can use, were not made by all of the pre-Hispanic societies. Um, they were made by few societies, specifically we're going to talk about the Mochica pottery, right? And we know also that, and most of the North Coast societies of Peru use or created erotic potteries. We know, for example, of the Bicus Society, which is older than Mochica, they produce erotic potteries. We know of the Chimu of the Lambayeque societies, they produce erotic potteries. But the rest of the societies of our history didn't produce much of erotic content in their potteries. They, it is not like all of the societies created these ceramics, okay? So um, it is important to uh, understand that, for example, the Incas, the Inca culture, the famous Inca culture didn't produce erotic potteries, right? So they were not interested in represented, representing erotism in the potteries. Which ones were the societies or which one is the society that mainly produce erotic pottery is the Mochica. Hola, Delaina. Thanks for joining, amiga. Um, so here we can see, and as I said before, this is going to be uh, um, an event with some explicit um, erotic representations. So if you have children around, please um, take them to another room because um, this is going to be um, very, very, um, let's say like uh, real in terms of the representations, okay? So uh, for example, let's begin talking about the sexuality in the Incan times. Right? Why we don't talk about sexuality in the Moche times or in the Caral times or in the, I don't know, any other pre Inca society? Because we don't have information about that time. Who were the ones who documented the sexuality of, or the behavior, the sexual behavior of the indigenous of this territory? The Spanish, the conquistadors. They were the ones who documented everything. And of course, they had a very, you know, like they were very close minded about certain things. For them, you know, their, their fertile was their religion and their culture, right? So we know, for example, that the Incas consider sexual relations between young people normal. And virginity was not considered uh, uh, something that to be appreciated. It was even considered a defect, right? Uh, why? Because 
women of certain age, for example, virgin women, that was the, the conception of the people back then, that didn't, that kept their virginity until they were, you know, too old, uh, meant that they were not capable to make themselves be loved by a man or be, you know, interesting for a man, right? So uh, virginity was not valued like in Europe. And you can imagine that the Spanish were very, you know, like surprised of the way how the the, the local people, you know, were, um, you know, seeing seeing virginity. You know? So uh, the Spanish had to be very controlling on the actions of the indigenous. They had to control how they from what they dress, how they behave, or uh, when they went went to the church, everything, and including even the sexual conducts of the indigenous, because for them. That was not good, right? Um, so let's also talk about the puberty in the pre-Hispanic times, right? So what was the concept of, of puberty in the pre-Hispanic times or what happened in that period? Because we're trying to, to go to different times of the history of men and women, of evolution of the men and women in the pre-Hispanic times. So first of all, we know that, you know, the puberty is, is a passage to the adulthood, right? Uh, so in, in most of the societies in the world, there, there was this passage period, which usually was not very long. The idea of adolescency is really new. Also, you pass through this change in which for women was menstruation, that it happened around 12, 13 years old. Also, almost at the same time, men became you know, boys became men and there were rites of passage. For example, one of those rites uh, was the one for the men uh, was called the Huarachicui, which was a type of sort of like physical contest, uh, which still nowadays in Peru is represented in Cusco as a ceremony because we don't need to pass anymore for those uh, rights, right? But in the Incan times and even during the colonial period, the, the presence of the Spanish here, which was for 300 years, the Spaniards didn't prohibit it. Uh, some some type of festivities, some types of you know ceremonies, as long as they were not related with the gods of the indigenous, right? So, for example, in this case, this is a representation, modern representation of how the Huarachicui uh, was uh, made, uh, and it, we're talking about you know a physical contest in which men proven or boys proven they were ready to become men. Uh, Wada is like a little, like a, like a, could be a short or uh, like a diaper almost, or uh, like a short that um, you know was given to the to the boys who were participants of this event. Uh, hola, Ronnie. Um, so for the girls, there was a different um, rite, which was called the kikuchikui. Uh -huh. And for the girls, the moment in which they had to participate <laughs> uh, to the Kiku Chikui was much more easier to predict because it was with the menstruation, right? So in that moment, uh, the girls had to fast for two days. They didn't eat two days. Then after they were given a type of food that was made from corn, like a, almost like a puree of corn, and uh, they well, took a, a bath, they, they cleaned themselves, uh, and then later they were braided their hairs and they changed their clothes and they were officially, you know, adults or they were women. And, and with that, also for men and for women, came, you know, a moment in which they will have to participate of the the works, you know, of uh, plant, plantation, you know, and agriculture. And they were now men and women, right? So they had to be part of the force, you know, of, of the communities, right? So now we're going to talk about the men. By the way, I have chosen for this, <laughs> uh, for this part, uh, you know, this very interesting pottery, uh, that is uh, from the Moche or Mochica culture. And one of the styles of the erotic representation of the Mochica was this sort of like exaggerated representation of the genitals. 
Uh, we know that the potteries were not used for didactic purposes. They, they were not used like in schools to teach the children about, you know, how was the genitalia? No, we know that those potteries had magical properties. They were connected with ceremonies. They were connected with petitions that will be put in tombs, in the tombs of the dead, and will go, will travel to the dead, to the afterworld, to the underworld, right? So the way how we see these potteries definitely is not the same way how they saw those potteries. Uh, but when they were first discovered, like this one, for example, you can see how curious it is, like huge phallic representation. And also because this is a pottery, we can imagine that if you would like to pour water or liquid from it, out right the only way to do it is from the genital because if you try to do it from the top can you see the holes can you see the holes amigos give me a thumbs up if you see the holes over here see okay Cari. okay ronnie so you cannot yes read yes Tish. you cannot drink or you cannot pour water out through there because it will come, it will spill out everywhere. Oh, so that's why the only way to serve liquids from here was from the genital, which is related also with the virility or the masculinity, not the male forces. So we know that the chroniclers, the pre Hispanic chroniclers, uh, sorry, the Spanish uh, chroniclers, such as, for example, Pedro Ciesa de Leon, one of the greatest chronicles of the history you know, of, of that period, uh, it mentions that, uh, well, first of all, the conception the Spanish had about the men in Peru vary according, the indigenous men vary according the locations. They believe that the men of the Andes was much more given to working hard, to be a very tough worker. And the men of the coast, in comparison, was much more relaxed and vicious. They said that the men of the coast were vicious, right? That they were more inclined to relax in, you know, and to, um, and, and to work less, right? Um, so also, we know that, um, for example, men in the pre-Hispanic times, and this we know because of the chronicles of the Spaniards, this was the, the same thing that was, you know, like continued things that, since the pre-Hispanic times, consider, you know, very important to have a large penis. And how we know this, you know, even the, con the conquistadors and the chronicles made notes about this. Uh, they said that the men with a small genitals relate to magical actions to enlarge it. You know, like using different uh, medicines and going to the shamans, you know, and even pay a special respects to a deity called Rukana Koto. This was a god, uh, Rukana Koto, which the story says, the tradition says that he had a large penis and he made very happy his wife, which was another goddess. So uh, that's why. The men uh, of that time, if they wanted to have a much larger genital, they pay their respects, they, uh, they made payments to this god, Rukana Koto, right? Um, so, well, you know, these this intentions, you know, that, uh, for example, we see in other parts of the world, you know, this, this attraction for having a much bigger uh, uh, genitalia in the case of the men also existed in this part of the world. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, by the way, to all the people joining to this event. Um, we are talking about sexuality in the pre-Hispanic times in, in pre-Hispanic Peru. If you were not able to come from the beginning, no worries, because I will be posting a recording of the whole event in my YouTube channel. So if you miss the beginning, no worries. You can see it in full in my YouTube channel later. So what about women? Uh, <laughs> yes, that's Ronnie. Um, so women, you know, like we're indeed treated differently than men. Uh, unfortunately, the chronicles of the Spaniards um, 
cannot go deeper in, in the way how women were treated in the ancient times, like by all the societies than the Inca, because they just met the Incas. Also, they had a perception of the things according to the Inca's time. So one of the things that I was able to recopulate about women in that period of our history is that, for example, with the wet women, uh, sort of like they embrace abstinence. So they didn't remarry it. Right. While men uh, that lost their wives try to marry as soon as possible. Right. Um, so well, and, and also socially was seen much better than men will remarry uh, uh, after losing their wives or spouse than, than um, sorry, uh, men will remarry than women. Right. Um, so also another thing important you know, is that. In my recopilation of data for this event, I found it that women in that period uh, uh, of the history of the Inca times couldn't eat from the same plate than their husbands because that was considered to be misfortune, uh, a sign of misfortune. So men and women couldn't eat from the same plate. So there were some uh, big differences between the, the way how women and men were, were considered in that times. Right. Um, well, also another thing is that women work very hard. The, the the land they were seen as hard workers, so they were not seen like delicate flowers. You know, like they they didn't work. They were not physically you know strong. No, women was very in general very very strong in that ancient times. Uh, there were women also that were very pretty in the ancient times. The Spanish consider some ethnicities. Uh, that existed in Peru back then at their arrival, more appealing, more attractive than others, right? Um, for example, uh, there were women that even were described as uh, white or fair, uh, uh, and that for the Spanish, they were considered more pretty. Uh, virginity, once again, virginity was not uh, valued by the pre-Hispanic men. The value of women was not related with virginity. Uh, um, women and men initiated in sexual uh, acts in, in intercourse early uh, in, in their lives. Um, and as you know, the passage of poverty was at 13, 12, 13 years old. And after that, um, it was very common that, that people will start having some sexual uh, relations also. So let's talk about love and sex. And before I do that, look at this beautiful pottery. It is a, a nowadays in the Larco Museum and the, the bulba enlarge, right? So once again, the idea of the enlargements of genitals uh, is not just something that we will see on, uh, on the male representations, also, also on female representations, right? This is another piece that is in Larco Museum. And well, they are uh, different potteries in, in museums in the country uh, representing coitus, representing intercourse, many different. Um, but when we get to see them all, or we have the chance to compare them all, uh, especially the ones of the Mochica culture. Remember, we're always addressing the Mochica erotic pottery. Uh, you're going to see that the, there are not so many variations in terms of erotic positions. There are just nine erotic positions that are always represented. So when people say, like, for example, Vanessa, when they come to Peru and they say, I want to, uh, uh, to see, I want you to show me the Peruvian Kama Sutra, <laughs> which is usually the way how people refer to the erotic pottery. Well, um, not really, like, it's not that diverse, like the uh, Kama Sutra, the, the Indian Kama Sutra. Uh, just nine erotic positions uh, that are uh, represented, no? And also another thing to be mentioned is that uh, we will not just see, you know, intercourse between you know, humans, men and women. We're going to see all the very curious scenes. Um, 
they have been classified these erotic pottery's in, in different, uh, uh, let's say, groups. Um, for example, the most popular group is uh, the ones that are called the humoristic vessels, which are really not humoristic at all. But uh, one um, specialist in in, in pottery, in the erotic pottery classified them like that long time ago in the 1930s and for a long time uh, uh, the name remain so which are these representations of very very uh, big genitalia right we have also representations of people alive young women with death Right. Um, and for long, these pieces were investigated because we can see, in fact, like sexual acts and uh, we can see also um, uh, kisses. We're going to see caresses. We're going to see all kinds of actions, but of alive people with the dead. And that could be related or is now interpreted. Also, you can see one here as um, a way of interpretation of the life after this one. Uh, the life, uh, you know, beyond, you know, after after life, uh, and the relations with the dead. Gracias, Elena. Thanks for following. <laughs> Gracias. So um, we have well all of these uh, interesting, you know, like um, uh, forms of of uh, understanding these portraits. But to be honest, you, we can give a thousand interpretations but we will never be sure of what they believe about those portraits. We have the well, erotic positions, you know, like realistic uh, positions. And we have the ones that are more magical, which are related between, you know, like gods uh, having uh, sexual relations with alive people, humans, gods and humans, or some type of anthropomorphic uh, uh, element of uh, people that that are mixed with animals that are having sex with alive young women. So um, let's say these are some of the variations. Marriage, you know, and, and also before that, you know, naked bodies are represented always. So um, there was no, you know, like taboos in terms of the naked bodies as much as, you know, in in, in Europe, in the European art, for example, of that time, we're talking about the conquest, you know, the clash of the two cultures. 16th century, the Spanish came, they had their religion, their taboos, their traditions, and we had ours, right? But uh, people were much more, you know, like um, uh, they embraced much more their sexuality in many ways no, than the Spanish did. Um, so most of the erotic vessels are completely like sh showing, you know, er uh, naked bodies. You know, like, uh, and even more, you, you'll see that in a moment, right? Um, so, well, important is to talk about uh, the, the beginning of life, you know, the, the birth. Uh, but also before that, the marriage. I would like to talk about the marriage before the birth. Um, so uh, the model was monogamous in the, in the pre-Hispanic times. So only the Inca, the Inca was the absolute ruler, the king, uh, could have many wives. He had one principal, one more, more important wife, but, uh, well, he could have many, many, many more. Uh, but the rest of the people were monogamous. Mm, they practiced monogamy. Um, but before marriage, there was a, a system these people had or our, my ancestors had that continue in some parts still a tradition that was called Servinacui, which was a trial marriage. So um, nowadays in the world, most of us have done something like that, right? A trial marriage, you know, like we live together with the person we love and we check like how is our, you know, like a, um, our, our relation and, and then well, it passed sometimes and then we say, yes, I am sure this person is the one for me. Uh, so that trial part, the Incas had it and it's called or was called Servinacui. So um, this this couple could live together for, let's say, one year, two years, three years. And after that, if they were sure, you know, they could get married. And that was forever. If you got married, there was no divorce in the pre-Hispanic times. But from the Servinacui, you could separate. And what if you produce children during the Servinacui period, if you're wondering? Well, um, if you 
for example, uh, separated after the Serbinaco, the trial period, marriage uh, trial, um, the children will go with the mother and will go to the family of the mother. And if she married later, those children will continue being part of the family of the mother, now the husband, you know, of course, of, of the of this mother, no? So um, it sounds to me very, very distant, actually, like uh, they, they were way more open uh, to, to having trial times before marriage. And um, pregnancy, and this is a representation, by the way, of how the labor was uh, during that pre-Hispanic times, we still also respect that system, like squatting, you know, system. I don't know if you have another name to, to, to call this type of, you know, birth um, or delivery or childbirth. Um, so the, the idea was that a midwife will help the mother and with the help of gravity also take out the babies, no? So the men and women of that time, they were very afraid and were very superstitious, very afraid of having children that were deformed or had some, you know, like a, a marks in, in their skin because they, that was considered to be bad omen. If they had something like that, uh, like if they passed through something like that, like a child with some marks or some deformations, they will fast. They will do many ceremonies to correct uh, their behavior because that was believed to be their bad behavior that affected the child. Mm -hmm. um, also, after giving birth, women couldn't have sexual relations for a prolonged space of time. Up to two years, uh, sexual relations were not uh, acceptable. Why? Because... Um, that could be a, a, a way to interrupt, uh, if you got pregnant again, the milk, right, of the mother. Or uh, you couldn't breastfeed your baby. So to avoid interruption of breastfeeding, uh, sexual relations couldn't happen during that period. But um, some potteries, and I think this one, Oh, this is another one of the, uh, also another position of that same beautiful pottery that is also in the Larco Museum. Both of them are uh, breastfeeding and also the delivery. But, um, okay, here. But after um, investigation on many pre-Hispanic potteries in which we've been able to see uh, um, scenes like anal intercourse, uh, a heterosexual anal intercourse in which we see clearly men and women, we assume they are a couple, they are husband and wife, you know, uh, they are performing uh, anal intercourse. And in all of these representations or most of these representations, you can see a child next, right? So what could be referring to uh, this? So probably this is the period after the childbirth, in which the mother doesn't want to interrupt their product, her production of milk, also she doesn't want to get pregnant, but she want to also please her husband and uh, accept to have anal intercourse, right? So like a type of uh, contraception, like a type of contraception of that time. Oh, uh, we have again, this is another image that I found for you. I think is way more clear. By the way, amigos, can you see uh, uh, you know, the, the refer area? It's very interesting how the artist has, you know, very wisely cover the body with this little, like a fabric, right? And it's just locating the attention into the uh, the, the, you know, the intercourse. Uh, so uh, can you see my friends? By the way, can you see me well? Uh, how is my internet? Everything is okay there? See, Kari? Okay, that is fantastic. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure everybody is like in awe. <laughs> everybody is surprised. <laughs> okay, Ronnie, gracias, Bri. Gracias, Jenny. Thank you, thank you. And and also, well, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the well, life after death, how people perceive their deaths. Um, well, we Peruvians nowadays are much more influenced by the uh, by the 
Catholic religion, right? Um, the Spanish came, they introduced a new religion. They used force to introduce that religion. It was by force, but also eventually we embraced the Catholic religion. And as a way of survival of our own traditions, we added our own elements into that religion. But sometimes we cannot even recognize anymore from where certain elements are, are coming from. We believe they are Catholic, but they are not. For example, the call to the dead. We still pay respects to the dead. Mm? You have to go to a, a cemetery on the day of the dead in Peru, and you will see that for sure. Uh, so here we can see dead, but they are not so dead, right? They are pretty much alive, no? They are having sex. They are touching each other. They are kissing. You know, they are caressing. They are embracing. So the perception that people had about the dead in the underworld is that they continue existing. And they could be reached out oh, when they were needed. The dead fertilize the soil. And this is not just like poetry. This is really the way how things are because the dead are, are part also of the soil and from them new life comes, right? But they understood this as something way more poetical. No? So they, they were the ones who nourish the soil where we are. And where they are down below, they still can have uh, the things uh, the, or, or do the things that they used to do here. Uh, so one of those things is sex, for example, right? Um, so we're going to continue here. And uh, well, um, let's talk about two controversial topics here. One of them is uh, the um, uh, prostitution in the pre-Hispanic times and also would like to talk about homosexuality in the pre-Hispanic times. Mm -hmm. So about sexual prostitution um, of women, of course, um, we know about it thanks to the chronicles of the Spanish. Uh, for example, one of the most important chroniclers of, of the, uh, that period of transition was Garcilaso de la Vega, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. And he mentions that they were public women. That's how he called them, public women. They were um, also called Pampairuna. Oh, uh, Pampa is the, the, the fields, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the mountains, you know, the open spaces. And Runa could be people, person, right? So the woman uh, of the fields, oh, these women, they live outside the cities. They didn't live in the cities is what Inca Garcilaso de la Vega mentions. Oh, uh, also that they were not well treated, by, by the people of the cities. Although they were important, they were part of the society, they live outside the cities and women, which were not Pampairuna, which were not prostitutes, didn't engage in conversations with them. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, well, the, the prostitution existed in the in the Inca times. At least we know this from the from the Inca, um, let's say, approach or the, the approach to the Incas that the Spanish had. Um, but unfortunately, there are no more information besides those that we can know in this moment, right? Um, also, let's talk about male homosexuality. There are some representations of, um, for example, anal intercourse between men. Um, and what we know from the potteries is that this existed, of course, because the potteries show this. But um, what we know about how they perceive homosexuality, we just can know from the Spanish chroniclers, well, the documents the Spanish made, in which they said that, for example, homosexual relations were quite rare. They were not very common. Right, uh, and that the Incas punished uh, the, um, let's say, homosexuals. They punished them, they persecuted them. But look at this information I found, that the Incas persecuted homosexuality because it was not allowed in their kingdom, but the territories who were recently, that were recently annexed to the Inca empire, almost at the, at the end of the Inca empire, the ones of the coast, uh, they, uh, the Spanish mentioned that in there, the Incas persecuted homosexuality. And also it is uh, referred to some type of religious sodomy 
in the uh, in that period. No, uh, another chronicle mentions that the evil made you know like a uh, found a way into the hearts of the indigenous. You know, like a uh, uh, making them incline to to accept homosexuality in a religious uh, field. No? Uh, he also mentions that there were young men in the service of the temples who dressed up as women and behave as women. Mm? But remember, we're talking about a, something more like a ritualistic. Also, oh, it was allowed but more for the religion. And, and what is some people have come to the conclusion is that probably because these men impersonated in themselves female and male, so both sides in one and for us, uh, for, uh, this idea of the, the two, the female and male, up and down, sun and moon, you know, it, it was together very powerful. That's why these people were considered to be important and they were even ceremonies in which they uh, participated. So I think uh, this one here, we're coming to the to the end of this um, event with a couple of ideas. First of all, punishments. I would like to mention that before we come to explain this piece <laughs> that is very funny. So uh, we know that there was death penalty in the Incan times uh, for adulterers, for example, or uh, people who committed abortions, incest, or uh, homicide, homicides, and homosexuality, right? So the Incas were not so open-minded as sometimes we think, but of course, what, what can we ask for, right? But, uh, you know, they are a society that also had their own traditions and their own, you know, like a, a vision of the world. So we just have to understand that they could be open in some things, but not open in every, every aspect, no? Uh, so there were punishments you know, for for uh, these behaviors. No, um, so here we have a representation, a modern representation in the north of the country of the erotic pottery that the one we've been discussing to, <laughs> uh, the one that is the exaggerated erotic pottery, uh, which now has become a famous touristic destination, one of the famous stops uh, in the North Circuit of Peru, where the Moche culture or Mochica culture also existed long, long time ago. Uh, so the descendants of those Mochica people are very proud of their culture, uh, of their tradition, of their potteries, and they are so clever that they have even turned those into touristic opportunities. <laughs> So, yes, Carrie, is slightly exaggerated, just a little bit exaggerated. So I, I hope you enjoy today's event, amigos. Let me turn on the light just to, to thank you all for your participation. And it's always a pleasure to have you here, my my all time friends, my new friends also that are just joining. As you know, I do these events a couple of times a week. I do lectures from home. We cover about all kinds of things. I I haven't said no to any topic you have asked me uh, to cover because I think every every topic is an opportunity to learn more about Peru. Uh, also, Janine, thank you so much for your tip support. Thank you so much if you are able to support this event. It is not an obligation. I know it's not always um, possible, uh, but also when you support a, a guide, like for example, in my case, if you are able to support me, we are immediately supporting Hago because Hago takes a a little commission from your tips or your donation and in that way we can keep Hago a free uh, platform also every, everybody all can come and education I believe is should not be a privilege education should be something you know that you should take if you want you know and use it and uh, digest it you know and, and and then later use it in the benefit of others gracias Brie. thank you my dear muchas gracias uh, also if you if you can uh, um, well become a, a sponsor of this channel, that would be super fantastic. The sponsorship program uh, helps me and helps other, um, let's say, content creators and guys to create events uh, every month. Uh, it is like a, a little fee of $10 per month. And, and that is going to be, you know, always coming to support the channels. So you can support your favorite content creators and guys. And in reward, every guy is doing something different. In my case, I am writing 
two books. I have also a little booklet about um, uh, legends of the old Peru, uh, demons and, and gods of the old Peru, which is for free. Is uh, also thanks to my sponsors that I'm able to create this. There are two books that are also exclusive for my sponsors, one cookbook and also a guide of Lima. Uh, and I do a Spanish classes for anyone who would like to practice Spanish with me privately. So I have two per month Zoom classes of Spanish that I am offering to my uh, sponsors. And we also record those events and we send privately to my sponsors, the ones who want to practice Spanish. So muchas gracias for that. Thanks to my sponsors who are today here also and who always help me to uh, create content for all of you. And gracias, Cari. Gracias, Ronnie, querida. Thank you, Bree. Thanks for coming, Janine. And uh, hope to see you very soon in another occasion. You can see also a, a recording of this event on my YouTube channel. Go to my uh, profile in HeyGo, uh, and there you're going to see a link to my YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram. All the best to you, amigos. Thank you so much, and best to you all. See you soon. Gracias. Gracias, Cari. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. My pleasure, Virginia.